Last week's uh, sermon dealt with an analysis of Matthew 24 with an emphasis on what some people call the end time signs. Wednesday night in our study, I mentioned only that day having people with all that's going on in the Middle East mentioning this very chapter. And the day after that, I was listening to the same program and they were still on this. Some fundamental things, in fact, by the very fact they're called fundamentals, they're foundational, must constantly be kept before us. And man-made religion is one of the most heinous things that thwarts the church of our Lord as we read of it on the pages of the New Testament. And you'll remember as we set the stage for the study of what we have in our Bibles in Matthew chapter 24, that last week we noticed the Lord looking over at Jerusalem in verse 37 of 23, saying, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as the hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Then he said, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. I made a point to emphasize that when Jesus twice cleansed the temple, he talked about it as God's house. And even in cleansing the temple, he pointed out, you have turned it into something God never intended it to be. Well, they were not going to be genuinely repentant and return to what the law of Moses taught concerning the temple. And now for the last time, Jesus is about to leave the temple. He says plainly, your house, all we have to do to make the Lord's church, quote, our church, unquote, is to do as we please. That's all. Thus we have the earnest, bold, plain declaration of whatsoever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. I suggest to you that for many years now, that passage and others like it, though many people might quote it, have not understood what it means to our daily conduct in the church. It means that without authority from Christ, we have no business to act. It means that those things that are forbidden specifically, we dare not do. And when it comes to this from our Lord's ministry, he says, you've made this house your house. I don't want that to be said of us spiritual Israel today, the church, the family of God, the kingdom of Christ, the body of Christ. Because it can become, regardless of what's on the marquee out front or above the door, or how we advertise ourselves, it can turn from the church of Christ to the church of us, just by following man-made doctrine. <clears throat> now think of all of the various man-made doctrines that are out there. We probably don't even know all of them. But they range from all of the world religions as they're called, such as Islam, Buddhism, Confucianism, the Hindus, and so on, down to the various denominational doctrines that have been formed by men. Now, we may be very upset, and we ought to be, at the moral apostasy of people from what in general used to govern a great many more people than now, and that is biblical morality. We ought to be upset about that. There's something wrong with us if, if we're not vexed as Lot was by Sodom from day to day with their ungodly acts. Now, to make us want to live closer to God by knowing better the Bible 
ought to make us want to seek to save those who are lost in their sins. It ought to make us want to defend the truth. But you have to know that truth that sets us free, John 8, 31 and 32, to be able to do that. But I want us to realize that when you go back to the Old Testament, there are things there written for our learning, Paul said, Romans 15, 4, that you have set out at the division of Israel into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom of Judah. The beginning at that case, it's not the beginning of it in the world, but in the case of the Jews, you had the religion of Jeroboam. Now Jeroboam knew exactly what the law said regarding how the Jews were to worship. He knew the place of the temple and the Levitical priesthood and all the, such things. He wasn't interested. The word of God for him that day didn't mean a thing. <clears throat> One thing you have to do today when it comes to being a Christian and all the New Testament defines that to mean a member of the church that Jesus purchased with his blood Acts 20 and 28, is to realize there's a host of people like Jeroboam. They may know what it says, but for some reason or the other, they don't care a thing in the world about doing what they know it says. I don't know what happens in the mind of a person like that, but I don't want to find out, for I'm afraid I would become one of them. A good, healthy fear of losing one's soul never hurt anybody. When we're taught to fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, that is not just a terror in the hearts of a person because God is what God is and we know it. But it involves an awful, awesome respect for the great I Am. And it causes us to respect his word. Now, since I've been preaching, which is a good many years now, I think from my youth to this present hour, I've seen so much in the church from the mid-60s to this present hour that says, I know what that says. I can explain it to you. I can define it. I can go back to the Greek or the Hebrews, the case may be. All that kind of thing. And you want to ask the question, well, what's keeping you from doing it if you know it's the Bible, the Word of God? Well, do you remember that the writer of Hebrews writing to Jewish Christians who were actually thinking about giving up the New Testament system and going back under the law? that he reminds them of the children of Israel in the wandering in the desert, in the wilderness, as they left Egypt. And he says, they knew the truth, but they had no faith. They had no confidence or trust based upon the truth and the truth only for their day. And thus they did all those things. It caused everybody 20 years old and upward to die, save Joshua and Caleb, and they were never allowed to enter the land of Canaan. Brethren, that's Old Testament history, but it's written for your learning and mine as spiritual Israel. I don't want to be a part of a Jeroboam-formed religion. It did not come from the will of God, but it came from the arrogant mind of men. You may not understand why some people come up with something that is diametrically opposed to the plain teaching of the Bible, but you can know it came from a person who arrays himself against God. People can and should learn from the things written before time, Romans 15, 4, but they don't. But I want us in a general way to study and see what's wrong with man-made religion. Now, for some of you, you already know. But you need to ask yourself a question. Am I following a religion that originated in the minds of men? Or as one preacher described it, the fermented minds of men. Because all man-made religions have their origins in the human heart. And by that I mean the mind. 
And Jeroboam did as so many do today in relying upon his heart instead of the word of God. And 1 Kings 12 and verse 26 tells us that. I suggest there's one of the first problems in the Lord's church. Brethren, we, in striving to restore ancient, pure, primitive New Testament Christianity, left denominationalism because it cannot be supported by the authority of the New Testament. It's condemned in the prayer of Christ in John 17 and by Paul by command in 1 Corinthians 1.10 and the general tenor of the New Testament and the idea of there's one body in Ephesians 4 and that body is the church, Colossians 1.18. People don't want to believe it. They want to believe in denominationalism. So that's moved in to the church. I had a lady in my first full-time work. Now we're going back well over 50 years, closer to 60. When I had dealt with a certain false doctrine in the pulpit by name, she came out and she was probably roughly then my age now, somewhere in that vicinity. And she simply said, why don't you just preach the gospel and let other people alone? Well, I didn't know much then. <laughs> But I knew more than that. And I've learned a whole lot more since then. I was privileged and blessed to hear local preachers, sound men. And using my own mind. And you know, God expects us to do that. He actually expects us to use our own mind and know how to use it properly to think, to reason. To look at the Word of God, understand it, and make proper application in our day of this 2,000-year-old book when he gave us his truth. And I thought, how do you preach the gospel to a person in sin, whatever the sinner sins, and let them alone? How do you do that? I don't know how to do that. Even when you preach a general sermon that is the truth without making an application, you don't let people alone. Now, people may sit there in the pew and hear every word you said and do everything to fight against what you're saying so they can keep on doing what they really love. But the Bible in Jeremiah 10, 23 makes it very clear it's not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. Those old preachers of days gone by preached this no telling how many times because they knew unless you get that straight in your mind, it didn't make any difference about the particulars of the New Testament. You had to understand that you're not to direct your own steps left to yourself. But you hear a lot of people saying, well, I just don't see it that way. Well, I don't care how you see it. If you don't see it the Lord's way, you're lost in a goose in a hailstorm. That's pretty lost. And we've often quoted Proverbs 14, 12. There's the way that seemeth right to a man, but the end there are the ways of death. How do you apply that today? Is it still true? There's a way that seems right, but he ends up in eternal damnation and devil's hell. That, that, that frightens me about myself. It did long years ago because it means I have the power to do just what Eve did. That is, believe a lie when you've heard the truth stated plainly by God and even quoted it back originally to the devil concerning the tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Isaiah labored hard to the people of his day who had been exposed to the law of Moses, the truth for the Jews for a long, long time. And Isaiah 55, 8 through 9, making it clear that God's thoughts and ways are not man's thoughts and ways. And yet you see, still see people to try to do things their way. And so Frank Sinatra says, I did it my way. Well, I'll give you one guess as to where Frank Sinatra is now. I don't mean to bring up a bad thought, but that's exactly where most people are. Because you don't have to be a Frank Sinatra or some personage like that to be trying to do things your way or to justify yourselves in your own sins. So there can never come from the mind of man a system of religion or worship that pleases God. Never can. 
It does not originate there. Now, if you could get people to understand that's why we must go by the Bible and the Bible only, to realize that's the only way I can know whether I'm doing things to suit myself or doing things to suit God. Why do you do what you do? Suit yourself? Or to suit God? Now, when you make up your mind to do it God's way, in the way He said do whatever it is that He commands, in the way He said it for the reason He said it, do what He said in the way He said it for the reason He said it, then you're checking yourself or making sure you're doing exactly what God commanded you to do and you perform the commandment. You have to have some way of doing that. So a person outside of Christ must know what the New Testament says in getting into Christ. They must stick with it because that's God's will. Now once a person has believed that Christ is the Son of the living God, with such a belief that it can be called properly a living active faith, an obedient faith, that they comply with Acts 17.30 to repent of their sins, which is a breaking down of the old stubborn will, the seat of all sin and rebellion against God, that produces what people have called an about face. And then they obey to confess Christ, Romans 10.10. Now, they've done a lot when they've done that. And a lot of people are, or I'll say at least some, are baptized and they, they haven't complied from the heart with the prerequisites to qualify a person in the eyes of God to be baptized. Because this is a way of being converted, of changing. That's why a person who rises from the watery grave of baptism is a new creature. And a person who's believed, repented, and confessed Christ is not a new creature. They're still lost in sin. Thus they must be baptized, I-N-T-O, into Christ, Galatians 3.27. Being baptized for, unto, in order to a given end, what is it? The remission or forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. They must be buried in water, Romans 6, 3, and 4, Colossians 2, 12. Now their sins are remitted in the mind of God. He is the one we've offended, folks. He is the one we are deeply interested in satisfying, in pleasing, in being reconciled to. We want him to justify us. We have to take him at his word. And when we're baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, we rise from the water to the grave of baptism, a new creature, Romans 6, 3 and 4. How so? Our sins are remitted. Our past sins are gone. God remembers them against us no more. Now, let's just start with that, which virtually everybody in this room, if not everybody, is old enough to understand, has heard that more times than they can count. But you watch churches that begin to want to turn around, whether they're Churches of Christ are in the process of apostatizing, apostatizing from the truth or anybody else living according to the thoughts and precepts and ideas of men. And you'll find out they'll try to get somebody saved without, from the heart, obeying that form of doctrine which was delivered them through the gospel, God's power to save, Romans 1, 16 and Romans 6, 17 and 18. It, 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 there may be all sorts of other things that they do, corrupting the worship or whatever it is. But they will corrupt that because they do not take God at His word. God's will for mankind must be revealed, and it was. We have it in the inspired word of God, 2 uh, Timothy 3, 16, 17. Peter wrote about it in 2 Peter 1 and verse 3 and Jude 3. And anything, I don't care whether it's your mother or daddy, son or daughter, your best friend, elders, preachers, whatever. Anything or anyone who attempts to add to, take from, or substitute for the word of God is simply a perversion of truth, doing things their way and forgetting God's way. Galatians 1, 6 through 9. It's rebellion against God. You know, you think of rebellion, I think some people do, as like they're really shaking their fists right up at heaven. 
There are a lot of folks that are saying God's our Heavenly Father and Jesus loves us, but they're in rebellion to God. A man-made religion is for the sole purpose of pleasing man instead of God. Now, you can look wherever the error is coming from, even in the church, especially the church, whether it be from the colleges operated by the brethren, as far as I know, for the long run, they've all departed to a certain extent, one way or the other, from the truth. On some aspect. Now, if anybody wants to challenge that, um, you're welcome. Jeroboam feared that if the people went to Jerusalem... Well, the law of Moses said they ought to go to the temple that was there and worshiped as God intended that they would. That they would begin to respect Rehoboam, the king of Judah, 1 Kings 12, 26 through 27. Thus Jeroboam established golden calves at Bethel and Dan to entice the people not to travel to Jerusalem to worship. Brethren, I know that Christians, families, and the obligation the New Testament places on families to rear their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I know that they can get together as Christian families and provide education, even to the point of elementary schools and high schools and colleges. The concept itself is not sin. But the question that arises is it always expedient and advantageous for the cause of Christ? Well, it's certainly not when they begin to advocate things that are foreign to the New Testament pattern for the church in whatever particular it is. Yet all my life, from the time especially I was a child, things were not nearly as serious then in departure. I've seen people pretty much say, well, we sent them off to school, everything's all right. It's just not true. Strange thing that a school of higher education should be training students above all to think and to learn how to think and to examine all things, the whole facet, which is good. Instead, we send them up there and say, now, be good little robots. Because you know nobody knows any more about the Bible than those people in the Bible department. <laughs> and they're going to teach you the right way. And so they begin to look at mom and daddy, that little congregation back in Podunk Holler, as not having sense enough to come in out of the rain. And then they begin to go back and tell you these things. And mom and daddy become the taught instead of the teachers. And they say, well, they must be right. They came from that. They've got the doctor's degree. They've got this. They've got that. Now, I ran into that when I was, I guess I was about 20 years old. Well, it was earlier than that. Because I got into it with a friend of mine. We graduated from high school. And he took off to school and was writing me back. That's for an email, Jonathan. <laughs> and he was defending the use of mechanicalism from using the worship. Now I was at state school trying to teach him. And he was a Bible major. Now that was long before things got anywhere nearly like they are now. But termites operate that way. You don't know usually you have a bad termite problem till you step through the floor. That's kind of late. And yet you couldn't get people to listen. I remember talking to a preacher who was very important to me and established me in the fundamentals of first principles in teaching me back when I was 17, 18, 19, even in 20. I'll always be thankful that he taught me those things. And yet when we would come back even then, his son and I roomed together and told him what we were running into. He just thought it was a bunch of kids all upset, although he had reasons to think otherwise. And he told us that years later. Just a bunch of kids. What do they know? Selfishness motivated Jeroboam to offer alternative worship to the people. And selfishness motivated the people to accept a religion of convenience. 
Selfishness is what keeps denominationalism alive today as people demand to worship in a way that pleases them. So as we fight trouble in the church, we still have all that to fight outside the church. Because when people leave the truth of God that made them children of God and set them apart from all other religions, they begin to go back into it. They're just becoming like the religious nations around about them. A man-made religion pretends to be for the good of the people. That's what I've heard. Well, if you want the church to last, you're going to have to keep up with the Joneses. Well, I never knew the Joneses, and I didn't want to keep up with them. Jeroboam shrewdly says, it's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. 1 Kings 12, 28. You ever thought about that first part of the verse? It's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. You realize what he was saying? Remember Jesus with the Samaritan woman said concerning worshiping in Jerusalem, salvation is of the Jews. We're right. Why, was, why were they right? They did what the law of Moses authorized them to do. You realize Jeroboam saying, God's asked too much of you. Now, he wouldn't have said it that way. But you know, it really doesn't take much to convince some people that they should do what God said not to do. Jerusalem was the place God designated for the people to worship. And Jeroboam and nobody else had a right to change it. The same thing's true of the worship of God's people today. It must be in spirit and in truth. It must be directed to God. And everything that goes on in the worship period must have that stamp upon it. That this is directed to God. We've assembled to please Him, not us. Some people have you say, well, what's the big deal about a mechanical instrument of music? It's just not authorized. That's all there is to it. And we have examples from the Old Testament. Was God very particular about how the Ark of the Covenant under the law of Moses was to be transported? Well, just ask us. There's nothing indicates he just said, I'm going to break God's will anyway. But they started transporting the Ark contrary to the way the law said it ought to be transported. Then when the ox cart hit a bump and looked like it was going to fall, he just sought to steady it. And God killed him. Brethren, does that say anything? It says you cannot change God's will. They attend the church of your choice. Well, we fought it outside the church for a long time. But that attitude prevails with some in the church. They may say, well, we'll continue to go to a church that has Church of Christ above the door. But we really don't know that these other folks are all that wrong. Well, how long is it going to take for you to be them? In mindset, you already have become them. Attend the church of your choice. Well, why not have the idea, let's attend the church of God's choice and let's take the book of God's choice and let's believe it's the word of God, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, the perfect law of liberty, James 1, 25. And let's learn how to study and write and divide it, 2 Timothy 2, 15. And let's be determined to do only what God said. Why is that a bad thing? And not allow anybody to lead us away from that. And everything in the New Testament that says anything to do with music and worship to God says sing, 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 sing. S-I-N-G. Four words, four letters. What's hard to understand about that? It's not if you want to please God. And you know pleasing God is understanding Him and complying with His will and submitting your mind to His mind. For it's not any man that walketh the earth his steps. That's true of worship as anything else. And yet we give up. And what makes people denominational people, we start embracing it. There's nothing new under the sun. And the arguments to lead people away from Christ are not new. God condemns such religious division and the souls who practice and promote it will be lost. 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 13. Thus, man-made religion is in opposition to the infallible, the inerrant, the all-sufficient, and final revelation of God to man, the Bible. Jeroboam lied to the people in saying, Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, 1 Kings 12, 28. And we have a hard time thinking that a religious man would lie. 
Where have you been? Here a couple of weeks ago, there was a man who came on Sunday afternoon. Sit right back right over here. Close enough for Lynn to hear him singing because I heard her complimenting his singing after it was over with. He was seeking help. And we listened to him and we gave him some help. And he's all full of all sorts of things saying, hey, he's going to pay it back. I get paid on Wednesday. I'll be there. Well, we've gone through that before. And that man that uh, Lynn complimented, who was so, how would you describe him, Ken and John? Well, I mean, he had all the right words to say, didn't he? Complimenting me, having heard me on YouTube, even said he heard Ken. And no, he had all the words. And when the money was given to him, Ken told him, said, you know if you're lying to us, we can't do anything about it. But God will. Well, he cheerfully took the money and went right on because it didn't make any difference. He was lying through his teeth. We never seen him again. And all those promises he made, and I don't know how many of them he made before he left here and to Ken privately, he never did anything about it. Well, you say, yeah, but that's one fella. Folks, if you got one like that, what makes you think there are a lot like that? Especially when Peter's saying there are many false prophets which have gone out into the world, just like it was in the Old Testament. And here's one of them, Jeroboam. Now, had not God commanded his people to refrain from making any graven images? Yes, he did, Exodus 20 and verse 4. And it was the Lord, the Creator, and not some idol made by man that delivered the Israelites to the land of Egypt. But the people ran off from the teaching of the law they had heard for years, and they'd promised to Moses, we won't leave it. And Moses said, well, you will, and here's what's going to happen to you when you do. But they still went on. There are a lot of folks today who bemean the truth that there's only one church. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus promised to build one church. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23 says that body of Christ is the church. And Ephesians 4, 4 says there's one body. Now, think for a minute. If the church is the body and there's one body, how many churches are acceptable to God? It's not hard. But people don't like to use their minds and the truth of God. But people spend all sorts of time trying to prove that many churches are okay. Man-made religion becomes a snare to the people. And this became a sin for the people went to worship before the one even unto Dan, 1 Kings 12, 30. Jeroboam changed the object of worship. In all denominations, are nothing but an attempt of man to usurp the word of God and the power of God. Thus, we're concerned about what the church believes and who the church fellowships. I want to fellowship, and all the Bible means by koinonia and fellowship between brethren, and fellowship between God with everybody that's in fellowship with God. And I don't want to be in fellowship with folks claiming to be in fellowship with God when they're not. I have no authority to think any other way. Your emotions might say, well, you know, no. You know what the best thing you can do with your feelings and emotions when it comes to studying the Word of God, which is plain and objective, is when you feel yourself, oh, I feel so bad about that, when you know you're feeling bad about what God said for you to do, it just folds your emotions up and put them in your pocket and say, stay there. I'm going to think this thing through, prove all things, Hold fast that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. Mere men did not die for the Lord's church, Acts 20, verse 28. I don't care how they are and when it comes to the way they look, their education, how they smell, how they shake hands, how they grin, and whatever else. It means no difference. In fact, the most faithful men among us, we shouldn't follow them because they're who they are. They're pointing you to Jesus and the authoritative word of Christ, the gospel. Now, certainly the Lord didn't die for churches established by men. Psalm 127, 1. So denominationalism becomes a snare to so many as they believe they're worshiping God, but in reality they're engaging in that which is sinful and in opposition to the Lord Jesus. The last point I'll make today is that man-made religion is ever so wrong 
but has an appearance of being right. Now, Jeroboam knew he needed to keep an altar. He knew that he needed to keep some priests, and he needed to have a feast. And the scripture says in 1 Kings 12, 32, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And that satisfied a bunch of folks. When you see, and, and you can select any particular topic whereby the members of the church are embracing that's contrary to the authority of Christ, and you'll see it's because they're relying upon their own think so rather than the direction of God's word. Well, the way we all worship, we're all sincere. The fellow realize you can be sincerely wrong. We must be determined whether we're standing all alone by ourselves or just a handful like went on the ark. Those are the only folks that were saved, folks. Just those that got on the ark. And only two out of all the thousands upon thousands left, the, that left Egypt of the children of Israel, Joshua and Caleb, both 20 years old, 20 years old or upward, only those two, not even Moses, made it into the promised land. So when people deviate from the truth, I'm not talking about crossing your likes and dislikes. That's a thing we've got to realize. There's a difference in a way we do something and that which we're obligated to do by the authority of the Word of God, which demands that we understand how the Word of God authorizes and how we ascertain that authority, that we can know the difference between what's obligatory and what's not. But we don't just like baby birds this time of year. When the mother hits the nest, the little mouths just fly open and they take anything, she crams down it. But that describes a lot of people. Denominationalism is always mixed in some truth with the error, and false teachers in the church have done the same thing. They don't have anything to offer members of the church that hasn't been offered to the church a long time ago by denominationalism. I remember when liberalism first, and by that I mean those who lose where God and His Word is not loose. I remember when it first started showing up. It seems so long ago, and yet it's so short time ago. That people just didn't check a thing. And they thought the people that warned them was off base. But no religion founded by man has the authority to exist. Whether it's originating within the Lord's church, as did Jeroboam's false religion being a part of what actually was God's people of that time. The Bible is clear. Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 3.11. The Master spoke of every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up, Matthew 15.13. As the Apostle Paul admonished that we're to try our own selves, whether we're in the faith, we're to prove our own selves, 1 Corinthians 13, 5. If we would do that in all honesty, we wouldn't just accept what comes from this pulpit or from some elders or from a pulpit outside or wherever or somebody writing articles. We'd study it. Rather, the church came into existence because people were willing to turn away from the commandments and doctrines of men and not trust in their own mind. They were willing to question whatever they were doing and lay alongside the authoritative Word of God. That's the only way the church has ever come into existence is when the seed of the kingdom, the Word of God, is sown and men abide by it, Luke 8, 11 and Luke 8, 15. And they're willing to sacrifice for it. Are we? You may say, well, it's an awful late date. Better late than never. Because at some point, people have to begin. And we ought to say, why not let it begin here? If you're not a child of God, we've studied what the Bible teaches for one to become a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. A member of the church in which you read in your own New Testament. 
As a child of God, if you've wandered in any way whatsoever, leaving the truth, we urge you to repent of those sins, come confessing them according to God's second law of pardon for the child of God, and God will hear and forgive. If you're subject to the invitation of Jesus Christ, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.